9-11 was a singular event. For a moment, it united America like nothing else did. It shaped America in politics, war, and religion. Today's book was written within a year of the 9-11 event. Now, 20 years later, are the words written for America then helpful for all Christians today? Hi, my name is Terence and I'm your host for Reading and Readers, a podcast where I review Christian books for you. Today, I review When Worlds Collide, Where is God? by R.C. Sproul. 96 pages published by Crossway in September 2002. The hard copy is available for $6.14 in Amazon. It's $2.99 in Logos, but only for September. So if you want it, you have to get it before the deal ends. Last day to get it. Now, this book was written in the aftermath of terrorists hijacking planes, crashing them into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And the book opens with these words. As I am writing, the United States of America is at war. It is possible that by the time you read this book, the war would be over. End quote. Now, Sproul uh, in this book describes a united America. We have Americans planting American flags, flashing American flag buttons, Americans telling one another, God bless America. And if we could transport one of those uh, Americans uh, to today, that guy would be so dumbstruck. Today, we have Americans calling each other terrorists. We have Americans sounding like they want to kill each other. And we also saw America making a shambolic withdrawal from Afghanistan. So with the benefit of 20 years behind us, today's book, When Worlds Collide, gives us a what I think is a unique theological perspective of one country's response to a national tragedy when the pain was still very, very raw. Sproul here offers comfort, but a comfort that many would reject. He offers condemnation, a condemnation that is strangely, surprisingly, not limited to those evil terrorists. To a shell-shocked people, Sproul defies convention to deliver a powerful prophetic message. Was that message heard. Is that message still valid today? Keep listening. The book is divided into six chapters. I will sprint through each chapter. I will pick up and throw at you an idea, a question, or a Bible verse. My aim is to show you how the book progresses and hopefully entice you to read it for yourself. Chapter 1 is titled War of Ideas. Here, it would be easy for Sproul or anyone to just target Muslims. Or if he doesn't want to get personal, he could target Islam as a religion, philosophy, or worldview that is uh, in direct conflict with uh, whatever America believes. But he doesn't. Instead, Sproul sees the conflict not as Christianity versus Islam or West versus East, but as God versus everything else. He writes, I quote, Since the September 11 attacks on the United States, there has been much public discussion about the role of God in our lives, and we have seen an unprecedented response of the American American people in prayer and public worship. Suddenly, the God who had been exiled from the public square, who had been banished to the other side of the wall that separates church and state, was called upon to get back into the game. Sounds good, right? But Sproul continues on. I quote, It became fashionable for the nation to stage religious rallies featuring film stars, politicians, and clerics. Televised worship services called upon the nation to put aside theological differences and come together in a show of religious unity. Ecumenism got a shot in the arm as cooperation went beyond interdenominational Christian worship to worship among people of entirely different religions. The upside of renewed religious zeal was matched with the downside of syncretism. 
Now, while people were clamoring for everyone to come together, we see here that Sproul is calling Christians to unite in the, in the gospel. Christianity must not be relegated to be the same as all other religions, despite everyone's uh, good intentions and seemingly everyone's beliefs. And I love this next part, which just shows Sproul's insight and classic wit. I quote, Nothing is more un-American than to have an exclusive understanding of God, yet nothing is more fundamental to the biblical concept of monotheism than the exclusivity of the God of heaven and earth. In 1 Kings 18, we read of the prophet Elijah engaging in a contest with the priest of Baal on Mount Carmel. But try to imagine Elijah giving an interview to the media assembled to watch this contest. Imagine him speaking into a microphone saying, Well, you know, at the end of the day, I and the prophets of Baal really worship the same God. We believe in the same religion. We just do it differently. Our religious activity is not the same. There are elements in the religion of Baal that are different from the elements of the religion of Israel, but surely the God of Israel doesn't mind. In fact, he's honored when we celebrate our religious unity. Can you imagine anything more foreign to the teaching of sacred scripture than that? End quote. So that is a sprawl, <laughs> making his point very clearly and from scripture. So in a time of war and amidst calls of solidarity. Sproul not only calls true believers to hold the doctrinal line, he even sharpens the divide. He also asks the question that immediately comes after a tragedy hits. It's a question that everybody asks. Where is God? And the answer is God never left. And we only ask that question because we don't know who he is. In chapter 2, Peace and Calamity, Sproul asks, does God only bless? And he points us to Isaiah 45, uh, verse 6 to 7. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. Every thinking Christian will sooner or later wrestle with how a good and all-powerful God lives or works or becomes God in a world where people crash planes into buildings. And not just that tragedy, but all the rest of the daily tragedies that we numb ourselves to. Did God, who, according to Isaiah 45, who says, claims, declares to make peace and create calamity, does that mean that God meant for all these bad things to happen? Sproul writes, Provocatively, I quote, If God did not ordain all things, he would not be sovereign over all things. And if he is not sovereign over all things, then he is not God at all. End quote. What a terrible thought. Is, is Spro saying that God made it happen? He caused these things to happen? And isn't it more accurate to say God permits or God allows bad things to happen rather than saying God ordained it to happen as if God was an active, um, active uh, in, in, the, in the act. But if you just think about it, saying God allowed something bad to happen does not let God off the moral hook. Consider this. A policeman who does nothing when a crime happens in front of him is morally wrong. He did not do the crime, but he was powerful enough to stop it, but he didn't. And God can stop every single bad thing from ever occurring. God could have struck each one of those terrorists dead, the same way he struck Uriah, who touched the Ark of the Covenant, or how he struck Ananias and Sapphira, who lied to the Holy Spirit, or uh, how he struck King Herod uh, with worms, uh, who, because he accepted praise that, that he was God. Now, God could, but didn't strike them down, which means he, he wanted it 
to happen or another way to put it he ordained it to happen and we know he wanted it to happen because it did now i don't blame anyone for pushing back on this idea um uh, Spro doesn't go deep enough in this book to answer all your doubts. He doesn't go through all, you know, like how some books would, uh, all the Bible verses and then go versus uh, all the opposing Bible verses and consider different interpretations. He doesn't do any of that. Um, it is a short 96-page book. However, if you are still interested in this topic and you disagree very strongly uh, against this idea, I, I would still suggest that you read uh, Scott Christensen's book, what about free will? Reconciling our choices with God's sovereignty. And it is this book where I got the policeman illustration from. Now, just so that we can move on, uh, let's assume, let's assume that you can accept that God allows, okay, that's a better, uh, more comfortable phrasing for many people, or that God ordains calamities, okay? Now, if you can assume that this is true, it begs the question, what is the purpose? And for that, we turn to chapter 3. Purpose in suffering. How do we make sense of uh, senseless tragedies like 9-11? First of all, Sproul points out that there are no senseless tragedies. They may seem senseless because we are looking at it from our perspective. But from God's perspective... There is a divine reason. There is a sense. There is a, there is a purpose behind all these things. And two Bible stories make this perfectly clear. Sproul unpacks in detail what I can only do briefly here. The first story is the story of Joseph. Joseph famously told his wretched brothers, you meant it for evil, but God intended it for good. Now, let's just be very clear. What the brothers did to Joseph was bad. They wanted to kill him and instead decided to sell him because then at least they get some profit out of it. Yet, we also say that God ordained it to happen for his own purpose, which Joseph at first did not understand, but later he did. Now, God could have struck all the brothers down the moment they thought of killing Joseph, but God did not do it because he wanted Joseph to save the family, to save everyone uh, in that story. The second story is the story of Jesus. Jesus was crucified on the cross. The people who did it were evil. And God wanted it to happen. God ordained it to happen. Because God could have opened up the earth and swallowed all of them. God could have sent his army of angels to rescue Jesus. Jesus said that. Jesus said so to Pontius Pilate. God could have done so much for his son to rescue him. But God did not. Because God wanted Jesus to be crucified on the cross. So that Jesus could save everyone. Drawing from the Bible, Sproul gives us God's perspective on our pain. And this is the comfort if we know that God has a purpose in our tragedies. We can lean on God, just as all the saints before us have done. And just as everyone reading these uh, chapters are uh, getting used to uh, God being in control, uh, even within the calamity and through the calamity, um, Sproul throws in another bombshell and says that, God's wrath is not limited to those terrorists on the plain. Chapter 4 is titled The Grapes of Wrath. He unpacks Revelation 14, verse 18 to 20. I quote, or I read from the Bible. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and the blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. And 
Now, that is from Revelation, and that may not seem to make sense. What you can hear is uh, there is the wrath of God, and that is for all the earth. Okay. Now, this is what Sproul writes, among many things. i am just extract this one. I quote, We think of September 11, 2001 as the greatest day of calamity in the history of the United States of America. But that day of calamity is not worthy to be compared with the day of calamity that God says will come in the future when the grapes of wrath are thrown into the winepress and are trampled by his judgment. End quote. Hey, Spro, aren't you supposed to be condemning the terrorists? Aren't you supposed to be saying that how these people are so evil? Why then are you throwing God's wrath against us, against the victims, against, against a society that has been injured, that has been violated, that has been, that has been you know, you know, why are you doing this? Now, do you call this bravery or or or, or folly? <laughs> um, because Sproul is writing this very soon after 9-11. Uh, it's within a year. And I am sure he preached this on his pulpit, talk about God's wrath. So, in fact, even before 9-11, I mean, it is a com- common theme, a constant theme for Reformed preachers to talk about this. But... Soon after 9-11, do you really want to bring this up? And I mean, just to just to to put it into perspective, all right? Would Sproul preach on God's wrath in the funeral service of the victims? Surely, even the most even the staunchest of reform would see that how a message um, like this, uh, when the pain is still so raw, the loss is still so deep how that type of message can be perceived as insensitive at best, monstrous at worst. And uh, before we um, count uh, Sproul, dismiss Sproul, um, we must continue on to read chapter 5, for that is where Jesus awaits. Chapter 5 is titled, Finding Peace, and we soon read Luke 18, uh, sorry, 13 verse 1 to 5. Now, this is to me the most powerful verse which Sproul say for last, and I am just spoiling it for you by <laughs> giving it to you in this uh, book review. But because I think that it is most meaningful uh, for the subject at hand. Luke 13 verse 1 to 5. There were some present at that very time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who live in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent you will all likewise perish. Now, Sproul uh, makes the, the easy, I would say, the obvious links between the tower in Siloam falling and also the towers in New York falling and about our response, our questions that come, that we bring to Jesus. And Sproul writes, I quote, I wonder if Jesus could get away with remarks like that in 21st century America. In the midst of tragedy, instead of bringing comfort and hope, Jesus was saying, Don't look at those people as being worse than you are, because as long as you maintain a posture of impenitence toward God, you also will perish. I, uh, end quote. The rest of the chapter is a gospel plea where God, uh, sorry, where Sproul demonstrates our need for a savior and that only Jesus is that savior. And he tells us in very strong terms about the glory of the cross and our debt is fully paid and all these wonderful truths that sustain the Christian. And and hopefully, uh, by the working of the Holy Spirit, um, draws the sinner to God. And 
this could be the last chapter. Sproul could have ended the book here, but he gives us one more chapter, the, the epilogue. The book uh, begins at ground zero, so to speak, at the tragedy of 9-11 and the declaration of war. And soon after, Sproul takes the reader's hand and leads uh, him to process what has happened by telling us that the answer is not found by looking deeper within, but rather by looking upward to God and having considered the God's goodness, his wrath and his sovereignty at the epilogue, uh, Sproul, like an angel who returns a saint from heaven back to earth, brings us back to ground zero. And here he talks about the history of war in America in brief and talks about the resolve that is needed to victory. Sproul writes, To maintain resolve in a civil war or in a world war is a different matter from maintaining resolve in a war against terrorism. In the first six months following 9-11, the nation went through the throes of pain and anger, and there was a surge of patriotism. Stores quickly sold out of American flags. Indeed, citizens displayed more flags in their yards, on their cars, even in lapel buttons, than we have seen since World War II. However, in recent months, the number of flags being displayed has been dramatically reduced. The surge of resolve has passed, perhaps waning until another attack against us. End quote. And if we look at the state of patriotism in America today, um, I think, uh, I mean, it's shocking compared to the, the, the difference between the two uh, uh, from uh, when this event happened and where America is right now. And... Um, and that last note saying that uh, maybe another attack will happen. Well, we know that there were no further attacks like 9-11 since then. But reading that, we are reminded of the fear and anxiety that gripped America then. And so this brings me to what I think uh, Sproul offers in this book that uh, other books um, can't or don't. For one thing... Um, Let's start. Um, this book, Sproul's book, introduces uh, God's providence, okay, his sovereignty, and also the problem of suffering. Well, if you struggle with, uh, with the idea that God, who, God is one who ordains even bad things to happen, and I can completely, I assure you, I completely un understand the horror of even that idea. Well, if you want to go deeper, other than Christensen's book, which I uh, recommended earlier, there is also another one, which is uh, John Piper's 700-page magnum opus titled Providence. Now, this book is actually easier to get into than Christensen's book, which is very scholarly and very um, uh, technical. This one by Piper actually is uh, um, draws from scripture, and then uh, it is very comprehensive. It is uh, after you read chapter by chapter and then he builds on this uh, God's uh, providence. And you, and you walk away with the uh, inescapable conclusion that God is indeed uh, God over all, that there is no part of uh, creation where God is not in control. And um, if you want more on that, you can read my review, which is uh, in episode 7. It's one of the earlier books that I, re I reviewed. On the other hand, if you would like to read on something about suffering specifically rather than God's providence, uh, I recommend uh, D.A. Carson's How Long, O Lord? Reflections on Suffering and Evil. One thing I learned from that book is the best time to read a book on suffering is not during suffering but before. I have taken Carson's advice to heart uh, in preparation for what I know as what Christ has told us that we will have troubles in this world. But take heart, for Christ has overcome all of them. So we read these books to again be reminded of how Christ overcomes. Now the thing about both of these books, Piper's and the Carson's, is that they don't focus on any one specific event. And maybe we want something like that because um, we don't want something so general. We want to see how, we want to learn how a Christian can process a tragedy. We want to make sense of a particular tragedy and we want to have an example. Now, there are bookshelves 
full of books on personal tragedies, whether it's broken marriages, whether it's cancer, or whether it's uh, dealing with uh, uh, unspeakable pain. I mean, there are so many people who have written uh, fantastic books based on their personal tragedies, which bring lots of glory to God, okay? But the thing is that there are not that many written on a public, a national level tragedy that is shared by all. So Joni Tada can write a book about being paralyzed, but because we're not paralyzed, so we may not be able to relate. But uh, if you have a national level tragedy that befalls all of us, so then we can we can relate together. Uh, this is a common shared experience uh, by all. So, I mean, is, are there any books like that? The only book that I can think of is uh, where it deals with, uh, with a huge event and it's writing straight after the event has occurred, is Augustine's City of God, written after Rome fell. But Rome fell a long time ago. <laughs> and Augustine's writing is difficult to, to get into. And his book is very big. The Penguin Classic Edition is 1,152 pages long. And other than City of God, I can't think of any other book that deals with the theology or the theodicy of a, of a major national or international tragedy. I'm sure there is one, but I just cannot think of one. So if, you, if anyone knows of any, dear listeners, well, please let me know via Twitter or the contact form in my website at uh, www.readingandreaders.com. So from where I'm sitting, um, Sproul's book, When Worlds Collide, offers a unique look on how Christians can and should respond to something like 9-11. He tells us we don't have to be swept up by the waves of sentimental unity, I would say superficial unity, or we get, you know, get thrown about by furious condemnation, that, that pure anger, that wrath that we feel uh, against those who have hurt us. Instead of being swept up by all these emotions, we can remain anchored. Okay, that is what Spro is telling us. We can remain anchored in the transcendent truth found in Scripture. We can look at things from God's perspective. Now, does this mean that pastors should not join interfaith or interdenominational worship services? For one thing, I don't think they should be called worship services because they're all worshipping a different person. Uh, but... But but instead of going deep into those type of questions, um, what I, I think this book offers is we want to know what the Bible says and, uh, and we want to read how Jesus responded to a question on a tragedy. And by knowing what the Bible says, it helps us navigate uh, all the other difficult questions. Questions like, is 9-11 God's judgment on America? And to tell you, um, Sproul says that uh, he does not approve of those who insisted that it was, but he did say um, he doesn't know and he doesn't count it out either. And there is the other question, which is the subtitle of the book. Where is God? Where is God in this tragedy? Where is God when the, the terrorists flew the plane into those buildings? Where is God in the midst of all our pain? And thanks to Spro in this book, we have certainty. We know for sure. We know that God did not go on a holiday. We know that God was not caught off guard when it happened. God knows. God is still in control. He remains all-powerful and all-present. He is still God and there is no other. Give praise to the Lord. This is a Reading and Readers review of When Worlds Collide, Where is God? by R.C. Sproul, 96 pages, published by Crossway in September 2002. The hard copy is available for $6.14 in Amazon, at least for today. For September, you can also get this book uh, in Logos for $2.99, and I believe it's the last day to get it. So get it as soon as you hear this episode, if you were not in time, then make sure you subscribe to this uh, podcast so that you will not miss any other book deals that you might have missed otherwise. There is another deeply, probably the 
wrong time to say it now, but because you probably have missed this. But there is another deeply discounted book for September, which is The Grace of Repentance by Sinclair Ferguson. It's uh, $6.49 via Amazon Kindle, but it's only $0.99, cents, uh, less than a dollar, okay, less than a dollar via Logos in September. I have read it, I like it, uh, but I don't know whether I will be able to review it. In case I don't, I will just say this. I never knew until I read this book how medieval, medieval our, our modern life was such that everything Martin Luther was upset about in his time so inexplicably speaks to our problems today. It was an eye-opener of a book. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Uh, thanks for listening. Bye-bye.